Hello and welcome to this episode of The Platform, where we host experts from the market to discuss business matters. Bahrain was one of the first countries in the GCC to have a public education system. Back in 1919, the first boys' school was opened. It was al Hidayah al-Khalifiyya in Muharraq. And in 1928, the first girls' school was opened. Since then, education has progressed rapidly in Bahrain. Illiteracy is kept at a minimum, at about only 2%, and most of the population are educated. To speak about this and more, and speak about the opportunities and challenges in education in Bahrain, as well as its contribution to economic development, we are pleased to be joined in the studio by the, by the president of the British University of Bahrain, Professor Julie Cross, but first to this report. Today we want to know how distance learning impact our students' lives. Is it a good education model to consider in the future? Or did it have any negative impact on the students? Let's find out from the students themselves. Uh, in present. In person. In person. Online. On present. I'm like 50-50. Online learning. Uh, in present. No, I prefer online because it's easier for us like a student for studying and uh, we are not in a specific place. We can study in the room, we can study in the salon, like this. Because it's uh, more like socially available and like we can connect with lots of people and stuff. And um, I feel like it's a much better learning rather than online. Uh, I think it's online good because uh, in school it's a little bit hard and uh, in house I can do whatever I want. Yani. I enjoy present studying because I get to see my friends, I can focus more, and then online, I usually go back to sleep during the first class. Because like, you learn better, and like, with the teachers even going more in detail in the subject, it's just better for your explanation, and like how you get it in your mind. I prefer in person, because when I'm online, I can't focus, and when I'm in person, I can be my, with my friends, and I can focus more. Okay, it's good for like, your study, and you can study good, and online, like, you can't study. Like, it's like you're sleeping in online. So I think it's good in school because it's fun there and you can meet your friends and study hard. In presence, because in presence I enjoy more with my friends and I can focus on my studies even more and I don't have any Wi-Fi problems or anything so like I enjoy more. Because I prefer on prison because uh, I can understand more from the teacher. Because it's easier, it's much more fun, I can do anything I want after, yeah, like in break, um, I can watch TV in my PJs. I can make breakfast anytime I want. Because um, on online, you can really lose focus at, on anything. But in school, like, it's fun. Because online, early, online learning is way better than like in person. Because teachers don't scream at you. It's easier to work. You can take your time. Uh, you can ask your friends if you need like answers. Well, not answers, but like they can help you. Some teachers that like, they don't want to help you, you know? And like sometimes they scream at you. And I don't like that. So online learning is better. I prefer in person because it's way better because in online sometimes things get messed up and some internets get messed up. So I just prefer uh, in person because I have better experience in it and for me it's better. Um, because it's better we can see our friends, no electricity in our eyes because we sit six hours on the laptop. It's so, uh, my eyes hurting me. Back to the studio with my guest, Professor Julie. Professor, thank you for being with us. Thank you for having me. It's lovely to be here this morning. Right. Let's start with the first question. After two years of distance learning due to the pandemic, students are now back to their campuses and back to their schools, and they're very eager to go back. But how about the huge amounts invested by universities in developing their distance learning systems how do you feel about this? I think the investment actually is something that we can continue to use going forward. I think now students are very used to distance learning. There are elements of their studies where we will still use that technology, um, certainly in terms of filming some of the assessments where they can do an assessment, they can practice that assessment and we can have a look if they're doing presentations at what they're doing before they do the actual presentation. We envisage that there will be times when it will still be useful to use the distance learning. If we, for example, have a member of staff who's 
unwell and can't come to campus but is still able to do the lecture they might then deliver part of that lecture through distance learning um, some of the staff are also still videoing extra bits of information so mini lectures using that technology and the students can watch it through the, the blackboard system that we use so it's I don't think we can go completely back right. um, but we want the students on campus we think that's the best learning environment for them I think they get more um, out of their studies uh, with their friends they are meeting new people all of those activities so yeah I think it will it's worth the investment right uh, this brings me to my next question about the young people in Bahrain a large proportion of them um, usually resume their higher education after school however about 65 percent of the youth go to public universities whereas only about 35 percent go to private universities why is this and what can private universities do to attract more uh, students i think um, there are a number of issues here i think cost is one so mm -hmm. finance it's it's more expensive i think to study it at a private university yeah. um, so it, it's really down to whether the students have access to those finances we are bringing in um, new initiatives to help students of course so the scholarships available um, we have scholarships for most students get some sort of scholarship at our university if they transfer in they get a bigger scholarship but there's also um, student finance now so a lot of the banks are offering student loans for, so to help the families be able to afford that sort of education I think the other thing is certainly with our university uh, it's it's taught exclusively in English mm -hmm. so it's really sometimes about English language skills as well so it will depend on the family circumstances and, and really people's ambitions of what they want to do with their right. education. Right. But isn't validating certificates issued by private universities a factor in this? Not really. I think there are a new uh, procedures in place that the universities are, are aware of and also with the Higher Education Council. So I don't think it's a factor really. Right. But can we say that nowadays, after the new validation procedure system, uh, the confidence in private universities is growing? I think it is, and I think there's, um, the other factor is as well, is you know, a lot of the private universities offer degrees from the UK or the US, uh, other countries, and I think if students have ambitions to have a globally recognised um, degree certificate then that's where they will be able to access these through the private universities. Right and does, does this contribute to attracting international students? I think it does I think if if we want international students to come in uh, we've got to have a product that is, is worth them traveling to Bahrain to come and study so I think if you've got um, the subject areas that students want that will get them employment that will allow them to progress their career and also having that recognition for those degrees as well that's really important right now uh, professor julie this brings me to my final question how do you see the correlation between research and economic development i think research is really important um, in areas of well, in all areas really, in terms of pushing forward, making sure that um, industry is up to date, is globally competitive, and making sure that also the students who are being taught as a result of that research are also at the cutting edge of, of their particular discipline. Mm -hmm. At your university, what do you do to encourage um, innovation, research, among your students? So all of our students uh, really from the first year are asked to conduct research, uh, their own research, so that they have access to lots of materials and databases etc. Is it compulsory? 
Oh, it's compulsory. Yes, yes they, they need to do that. So in every year of their study, um, we ask them to engage in research projects. Um, they need to be able to find information. They need to be able to assess information and be able to come up with solutions as a ba on the basis of the information that they've found. And it gets increasingly more difficult as they go through their studies. But really, it gives them that basis um, for being able to find out information and be able to, one of the most important things to think about is, is can you critically analyse? Yes. We have access to lots of information. How do we know it's true? How do we go through the process of validating that? So that is built into all of their modules. And then that sets them up for if they want to do their master's or their PhD okay. or when they go into the workplace. Right, interesting. Thank you, Professor Julie, for being with us thank today. Thank you for having me. Thank you. And thank you, dear viewers, for watching. And until I see you in another episode of The Platform.